stop, 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 please. Okay, it looks great, but do you know that the variable sweep wing made the F-14 lighter than it would have been otherwise? Do you know that it landed at a much lower speed than the F-4? Do you know that it could pull 7 Gs while flying at Mach 2? Well, if you don't know, just keep watching. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end because the stuff that we discuss here are difficult to find on any other video. In the late 50s, beginning of the 60s, all the major world air forces, including the Soviets, had three contrasting and apparently incompatible requirements. Long-range subsonic cruise or long-endurance loiter on station, high supersonic interception and transonic low-altitude strike, operations from limited length runaways or from aircraft carriers. It is intuitive how these three requirements may be incompatible, but well, if you are interested in the details, there is an entire video dedicated to it. However, the F-14 had all these requirements embedded in its DNA. Since its primary mission was the defense of the fleet and of other carrier group planes, the Navy wanted it to fly 500 nautical miles unrefueled with force power missiles and a gun. Check. It was also required to stay on combat air patrol for a long period, far from the carrier group, to guarantee a quick reaction when, well, the Soviet bombers appeared. Because at the time, the Soviet bombers armed with long-range anti-ship missiles were the most dangerous menace to the carrier groups. The Navy wanted the F-14 to reach a loiter station 150 miles out and stay there for three hours with six Phoenix missiles and the gun. Check! Both these missions require a high aspect ratio straight wing of relatively thick section generating a high lift and possibly a low span loading to help minimizing the induced drag. But we're not done. The F-14 mission required also to be able to intercept the enemy bombers at supersonic speed because once the enemy was discovered it had to abandon its leisure patrolling and chase it away as quickly as possible. High supersonic speed meant getting to the fire position early and providing a lot of additional energy to the already mighty AM-54 Phoenix missile. Now, unfortunately, the wing required for high supersonic speed could be either a short and stubby wing or a highly swept wing but this time with a thin section to reduce the wave drag. So to execute all the missions, two different types of wings are actually needed. And this is the reason why a variable sweep wing was chosen. One of the key parameters of the wing is the lift to drag ratio. We want to produce as much lift as possible with as little drag as possible. The higher is the ratio, the more efficient is the wing. The lift to drag ratio for the F-14 plotted against the Mach number and the wing sweep looks like this. Well, to be honest, it decreases quite a lot with the increase of the Mach number at low sweep angles. However, we can see that with a high sweep, the efficiency is low, but the loss is quite stabilized. This is understandable if we consider that the drag coefficient rises sharply from Mach 0.8 to Mach 1, but it is rather constant at higher speed. The influence of this behavior on the performance is much clearer if we plot the ratio times the Mach number against the Mach number itself. Uh, the chart looks like this. At low speed, there is a narrow band of very high efficiency that can be used for cruising and loitering. If we increase the Mach number, which means the speed, the efficiency drops very quickly, but the drop is compensated by the increase of the sweep with the speed. And beyond Mach 1, it actually improves a bit. If the plane hadn't a variable sweep wing, an intermediate position wing would have been quite a poor compromise. 
very far from what has been possible with a variable sweep wing. It would have required, for example, more fuel, more fuel meant more thrust, um, more thrust meant a bigger plane and so on. Supersonic flight is an entirely different matter. A new type of drag, the wave drag, becomes the predominant component of total drag. The wave drag is the drag associated with the formation of shock waves at transonic and supersonic speed. To be efficient at supersonic speed, the wing must be A. Swept back B. Thin and I mean thin in percentage of the cord. The maximum sweep for the F-14 is 68 degrees, which is enough to avoid interfering with the Mach cone even at high speed and to do a good job in retarding local shockwave formation on the upper wing surface, which by the way is what creates a good part of the wave drag. But quite subtly, the wing relative thickness is also greatly reduced. At a minimum sweep, the wing thickness is about 9%, good for low speed. At maximum speed, it is reduced to 5%, not because the wing is actually squeezed, but because the cord of the wing is longer geometrically longer. Isn't it clever? So yes, the wing actually is not a proper contiguous wing, but it acts like a sort of a delta wing with none of the delta wing features. Again, the inferiority from an aerodynamic point of view of a compromised sweep can be inferred by the comparison with the F-15. They are broadly similar planes, but the F-14 matches the speed performance of the F-15 with 25% less thrust to weight ratio. The F-14 did not have the low level penetration among its missions when it was designed. To be honest, air to ground missions were considered, but they were taken seriously quite late in the career of the plane and even in that case with not much emphasis to low level attack. However, the plane would have been quite suited to low level missions in this betraying the shared ancestry with the F-111. Uh, so I suppose we can have a small digression, it won't hurt anyone. The main aerodynamic quality that a low level bomber must have is to be insensitive or relatively insensitive to the vertical gusts which are likely to be met at low altitude. And to be honest, the low altitude turbulence is mostly due to warm air rising from the ground. The sending gusts are generally less violent. All this shaking can considerably shorten the structural life of a plane, but it may also be too hard for the crew to endure. Actually, the ability and the willingness of the crew of taking a punishment and still function is actually the limiting factor in low-level strike attack. One solution is having a high wing loading, that is, a, a proportionally small wings if compared with the overall size of the plane, like the F-105, for example. But this is obviously incompatible with all the other missions. Another solution is, again, to sweep back the wing, this time not because the sweep angle increases, but for two other different reasons. For the same geometric effect that we have seen for the supersonic interception, the aspect ratio decreases. The aspect ratio is a measure of how long and slender is the wing. With low aspect ratio, if the wing increases the angle of attack, the lift increases, but not so much. Uh, actually potentially quite a lot less than a high aspect ratio wing. If the lift doesn't increase much, then the hit taken by the plane when it gets into the gas won't be that strong, thus reducing the effect of the gas. Other reason is that when the wing sweeps back, the aerodynamic center goes back as well. Since the planes of this era are stable, that is, with the center of gravity ahead of the aerodynamic center, increasing the sweep makes them even more stable. It is as if they be become nose heavy, so if the gust that gives a kick upwards, it is immediately corrected by the excess of stability. I use the term excess of stability because this is a common problem of the variable sweep wing, the plane becoming too stable. An aerodynamic center too far behind the center of gravity also requires a higher tail deflection to keep the plane in equilibrium, which means a higher train drag and higher structural loads. The F-14 had the so-called 
glove veins to partially correct the problem. Their effect was to bring the aerodynamic center forward a little bit and alleviate the problem. If you want to land on a carrier, you want to fly slow. Landing on a barrier arrested carrier is an extremely dangerous operation and there are many accidents every year anyway. Actually, statistics have shown that the accident rate is roughly proportional to the cube of the landing speed, so every small speed reduction is actually welcome. To fly slow, and actually to fly in general, but also to fly slow, the weight needs to be compensated by lift. Since lift depends from the square of velocity, while the weight may, well, vary with time because you burn fuel, but doesn't depend from the speed, so if the speed is low, there must be something else to compensate the loss of lift. The wing does it. It can produce more lift by increasing the angle of attack or using high lift devices. The F-14 at minimum sweep already has a thick and high aspect ratio wing which is optimal for slow speed, but it also has single slotted slats and flaps that increase the lift produced at the cost of adding quite a lot of drag. This doesn't really matter because we are landing or taking off anyway, so we are not going fast. Actually, quite the opposite. In fact, the carrier approach speed of the F-14 was 213 km per hour, while the F-4, for example, was around 240 km per hour. The F-14, at minimum sweep, has flaps and slats working at their best. The F-4, which has a, a compromised wing, can't make them work as effectively. The sweep reduces their effectiveness. The F-14 wing at landing has a lift coefficient, which is the measure of how good is a wing at producing lift, around 2.5. The classical compromised swept wing is around 1, 1.5. Note that on the F-14 those flaps and slats were also using the intermediate positions while maneuvering, always with the purpose of managing the lift to drag ratio. It is not widely known, but the F-14, even if it was much bigger and heavier, with the help of its wing and high lift devices, could easily outturn the MiG-21. The F-14 wing sweep control system was fully automatic, while various other variable sweep aircraft had a manual control. It was introduced originally as a safety measure. If the pilot with the wing at minimum sweep would have turned at high G's, the bending moment on the wing would have been quite high. This would have required a structurally stronger wing, uh, which is also a heavy wing. The minimum sweep was 20 degrees and it was allowed up to Mach 0.7 and this measure alone saved about 450 kilograms of structural weight. What was introduced as a safety and weight saving measure turned out to be an efficient sweep optimizer based on a highly redundant air data computer. As we have already seen, changing the sweep optimizes the lift to drag ratio from the subsonic to transonic and supersonic conditions. And the automated sweep control did just that, decisively, decisively improving the plane performance. And this was not only the general aerodynamic performance, lift to drag ratio is related to turning performance in combat. Plus, the F-14 fuselage was also lifting body, further improving the lift to drag ratio, but this is a subject that we leave for another day. The other important consideration behind a fully automated sweep control was that changes the sweep while in combat was really impractical. For the pilot, it was one more thing to pay attention to rather than thinking to the combat itself. If the variable sweep wing was so effective, why it didn't last? Why today there are no more projects that make use of it? It is complex. It is heavy. It's hard to maintain. Uh, well, this is what you normally hear around the, the internet. And to be honest, there is some truth in it. But the problem should be approached in a different way. However, 
I am afraid that you will have to wait for the next and last episode of the series for a full explanation. Fully understand the coming video, you will need to understand how the shape of the wing influences its performances. So you should watch the previous episode, which is going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, as usual, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing. For now, thank you very much for watching and see you on the next video.